George Orwell, born Eric Blair, formed his political sensibilities fairly late in life, a fact that's perhaps surprising given his reputation. In an essay called Why I Write, Orwell describes himself as reluctantly political and speculates that had he been born in a peaceful time, he might not have been political at all. Orwell's catalyst came in 1936 and 1937 when he traveled to Spain to work as a journalist during the Spanish Civil War. On arrival, he decided to enlist in the fight against Francisco Franco. Orwell speculated that, had he been asked why, he would have said, to fight against fascism. If you asked him what for, he would have only said, common decency. Some elements of his political thinking were already in place. He instinctively felt sympathy towards the working class and distrust towards authority. When he arrived in Barcelona, a city that had converted in wartime to a worker-owned, classless structure, he said, there was much in it I did not understand. In some ways, I did not even like it, but I recognized it immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Orwell was assigned to a Marxist militia group associated with Leon Trotsky, which was allied with a communist militia group associated with Stalin and the Soviet Union. After months of fighting and making friends in his militia, Orwell was shot in the throat by a sniper, an experience he described as very interesting. Like being at the center of an explosion, followed by a painless shock that made him feel like he'd shriveled up to nothing. Orwell survived, and the injury meant that he effectively sat on the sidelines during a major political shift. The communist faction with allegiance to the Soviet Union had gained influence in the Spanish government and moved to eliminate their political competition, Orwell's Trotskyist group. This was a betrayal since they'd been fighting on the same side of the war. Before long, virtually everyone Orwell knew was either killed or thrown in jail. They were charged with conspiracy, among other false claims, which was picked up and spread around the world by press on the left. After making some efforts to help his friends, Orwell felt his own arrest was imminent. He fled the country and returned to England. The experience changed him. All right, stopping it there, and welcome to me, Curry Oxy Reviews, reacting to things on the internet. And today we're gonna be reacting to a breakdown of Orwell. And I think we all know Orwell's most famous book, 1984, and Animal Farm, and he's written other books, and he's had a lot of movies and TV shows based off of his literature. And I think that in an age of the media being extremely biased and postmodernism trying to change our language and censorship and constantly feeling like we're being more and more controlled, constantly feeling like our liberties are being more and more eroded, and constantly feeling like common facts and data and biology is now being told that is no longer allowed to be said and if you do say them, if you do speak them, you're no longer a part of decent society. Living in a world now where it feels more divided and more tribal than ever, I see a lot of people, including myself, constantly sort of quoting Orwell's and Orwell's movies, books, and literature, or just throwing out these sort of classic, oh, that's totally 1984, or how Orwell of you. But I don't actually know much about the man. I don't know much about his life. I don't know much about his past or his experiences or how he became the author that we now celebrate today. How did he become sort of almost a prophet of how society was going? And even listening to the intro of this video, I had no idea that Orwell fought during the whole Stalin regime, that he's actually seen and experienced his, his own eyes what totalitarianism and dictatorship does to a society and to a people, um, what control does to a people, what changing languages and lies and biased media does to a society. He saw it with his own eyes and I didn't know that. I don't know, maybe you guys knew that. Maybe I'm the dumb one, but I didn't know that. So anyway, I'm excited to get more into this video. I'll put the name of the YouTuber on this on the screen. And if you remind me, or if I remember, I'll put the link down below. Anyway, we're gonna go right back into it. But before you do, if you like to have videos, please like, comment, subscribe, hit that button, because notifications when I do upload. All of that really does help with the algorithm, guys. And if you like to support the channel even further, you can donate. My PayPal me link is in the description box below and sometimes in the comment section. Of course it helps. 
helps, but you don't have to. You can just like, comment, and subscribe. Another great way to support this channel is either join my brand new membership program, different levels, different tiers, different perks, or you can visit my brand new merch shop. Links down below and links to all of my alternative platforms, my socials, including my Twitter, all the ways to support me and all the ways to contact me for business is always in the links down below. I'll try not to stop it too much because this is a 15 minute long video. So let's get back into it and please continue to enjoy the video. The experience changed him. Orwell believed what happened in Spain was linked to the Soviet Union, where political purges were also being conducted, with lies and propaganda to justify them. He also believed that people in the West were falling for it, and wrote, It was of utmost importance to me that people in Western Europe should see the Soviet regime for what it really was. He published Animal Farm, which was a thinly guised critique of the Soviet Union, effectively saying it wasn't the happy, free, and equal place that it claimed to be. In reality, it was a highly unequal place, where a dictatorial minority used propaganda and political terror to manipulate the masses against their own interests. Orwell summarized the absurdity and the injustice of the situation in a proclamation made by the ruling pigs on the farm. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. He warned of the danger of political ignorance in such a society in the character of Boxer, who for years loyally works himself to exhaustion. His usefulness gone, Boxer isn't granted the retirement that was promised, but instead is slaughtered for meat and glue. His concerns with the Soviet Union were part of a broader concern on the nature of truth and the way truth is manipulated in politics. He brought attention to people's tendency to distort reality according to their political convictions. Reflecting on the Spanish Civil War, Orwell wrote, What impressed me then, and has impressed me ever since, is that atrocities are believed in or disbelieved in solely on grounds of political predilection. Everyone believes in the atrocities of the enemy and disbelieves in those of his own side, without ever bothering to examine the evidence. Orwell believed intellectuals and the media the people who live in the world of ideas were prone to being especially out of touch with reality. This quote is often falsely attributed to him, but it does capture his general position, and he did say something similar. Reviewing the media coverage of the Civil War, Orwell said, In Spain for the first time, I saw newspaper reports which did not bear any relation to the facts, not even the relationship which is implied in an ordinary lie. I saw great battles reported where there had been no fighting, and complete silence where hundreds of men had been killed. I saw troops who had fought bravely denounced as cowards and traitors, and others who had never seen a shot fired hailed as the heroes of imaginary victories. And I saw newspapers in London retailing these lies, and eager intellectuals building emotional superstructures over events that had never happened. I saw, in fact, history being written not in terms of what happened, but of what ought to have happened according to various party lines. Stop it there, stop it there, stop it there. There's so much that I want to say right now, but I'm going to keep it to a minimum. Saying that the intellectuals and the media, the people of ideas like postmodernisms or postmodernists or philosophers, the people that tend to lean in a very liberal, progressive, sort of Marxist, socialist, communist ideas in universities, and again, media tends to be very disconnected from the real world, from reality. Like a lot of these gender bending ideas come from postmodernists comes from academia, comes from academics, and it's pushed through media. The race realism comes from academic, comes from ap academia, it comes from academia and universities and then pushed into the real world where it doesn't make sense and it doesn't work out the way their ideas thought it would work out. In the whole Animal Farm book where he says we're all created equal but some are more equal than others, that sounds like privilege to me, that is pushed very much uh, in today's society. We're all equal but there's white privilege, there's pretty privilege, there's Eurocentric privilege, there's male privilege, there's female privilege, even though that one doesn't really get talked about that often. That's what it sounds like to me and the whole like the the one animal with the bulldog or something like that thought that he would get his just retirement for going along with this propaganda or this narrative but then he just gets grinded up and made into paste because we all know in these sort of totalitarian dictatorship regimes that's usually birthed through communism, socialism, and Marxism 
the bullet, the gun, always gets turned back on those who helped usher it, usher it in. We all know this. But anyway, I want to say more, but I'm not going to. Uh, we're going to get back into the video. He thought propaganda on the fascist side was even worse, and concluded, This kind of thing is frightening to me, because it often gives me the feeling that the very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world. Concerned with the effect this would have on history, he said, I am willing to believe that history is, for the most part, inaccurate and biased, but what is peculiar to our own age is the abandonment of the idea that history could be truthfully written. In the past, people deliberately lied, or they unconsciously colored what they wrote, or they struggled after the truth, well knowing that they must make many mistakes, but in each case they believed that the facts existed and were more or less discoverable. Orwell believed breaking our agreement that there is such a thing as a shared objective reality is a necessary condition for totalitarianism. Stopping in there because there was a little bit of a break. Um, going back a little bit where he says that the media basically lies and bends the truth and kind of create the story they want to create and then academics sort of take that false created history and emotionally construct their ideology from that because again it's a lot of emotions a lot of feelings and i believe and i think which i saw this uh this this i saw this one video that explained what nihilism was and asserted assertivism was i think am i saying it correctly i'll put it on the screen and i forgot the last one but it was like what happens when people just kill god right when they kill faith when they kill god when they kill a higher power because we humanly instinctually wants a higher power or a higher calling what do we do after that either you go into nihilism which is what is the point of life and i should just off myself or you go into assertivism and i believe assertivism is like lean into the absurdity um of nothingness or meaningless meaning meaningless <laughs> lean into the idea that nothing has meaning and is all pointless and I forgot what the other one was, but the other one was we have to create our own morals, basically. We have to create our own values, right? basically. We have to create our own principles and our ideas and our own reality. And I feel like a lot of people who lean into that, which I think a lot of postmodernists does, a lot of progressives does, because a lot of them are atheists. No offense to my atheists, not every atheist. But I feel like they create their own morals and their own principles and their own values based off of their emotions. Which, is nothing wrong with being leading with your heart and being empathetic and being sympathetic, but you can't try to create reality out of that. I don't know if that was a bit of a like side rant. Anyway, but I like that he said that um, it's no, no secret that the media lies, they've been the truth, they've been reality, they're very biased. And also, the whole rewriting and creating history is because academia is so heavily lent to progressivism, liberalism, and again, post-modernism, post a lot of professors identify again as communist, socialist, and Marxist. When you're rewriting history, you're gonna rewrite it, it through your idea, through your values, through your principles, and, and then construct your ideology emotionally through that. Anyway, let's continue. Totalitarianism became a major focus of Orwell's career and combined his criticism of fascism, Soviet communism, and the general willingness of people to bend reality for political purposes at society's expense. He described totalitarianism as the suppression of individuality for the sake of political orthodoxy. He wrote that it not only forbids you to express, even to think certain thoughts, but it dictates what you shall think. It creates an ideology for you. It tries to govern your emotional life as well as setting up a code of conduct. In the Totalitarian Society of 1984, Winston Smith's individuality is so tightly controlled that he is not even allowed to think a thought that breaks the orthodoxy of his political party. People who do commit thought crime are either killed or re-educated through torture until their minds are realigned with the party orthodoxy. Orwell was responding to totalitarianism spreading at the time in countries like Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union. But he also thought it was spreading in more subtle forms back at home, in England, through socially enforced, unofficial political orthodoxy. Many people participating would do so voluntarily, voluntarily censoring themselves when it came to certain subjects, and voluntarily conforming their beliefs to whatever their political party tells them. Orwell said those types of people effectively have gramophone minds. 
minds to play whatever record someone places on them. In 1984, Winston Smith's wife is a portrait of that person. Willingly surrendering her body and mind to the party of Big Brother, a process that Orwell believed dehumanizes people as they willingly surrender their identity and, in effect, become a machine. But he knew not everyone would voluntarily believe what they're told, and argued that in order for totalitarian regimes to control the broader public, they'd need to break down belief in objective truth, giving them a schizophrenic relationship with truth that allows them to believe the changing nature of reality as is presented to them by party politics. Stop it there, stop it there. I, I love this fucking video. I'm like super like, excited. I'm literally fangoing over this shit. This is the stuff that I fucking love to like listen to or react to. I have said this so many times. I've said it on this channel, I've said it on my other channel, and I've said it in my own life. When you group everybody up into a collective, you take that person's individuality away from them, and then you essentially dehumanize that person. It doesn't matter your values, your principles, it doesn't matter your past, your childhood, it doesn't matter what you actually believe, your conception and your perception of life and reality. It doesn't matter about your lived experiences. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is you belong to this group and we have already assigned that group a definition. And whatever de definition you fall under is just who you are and then doesn't matter your individual, your individual self, right? And so if you are white, it doesn't matter if you were beaten by your alcoholic fa father and you were on the streets in a drug dealer drug and a drug addict and you had a felony and because of that you couldn't get a job and you were living in poverty your entire life it does not matter you are white therefore you are privileged end of the same thing goes for you if you're black the same thing goes if you're a woman the same thing goes for the lgbtq community it's the same thing as you go for if you're disabled whatever you are under this category, so therefore who you, this is who you are. They dehumanize the individual. And if you notice, most people that are on the far left, progressive, again, communist, socialist belief system, they believe in more of the community and the collective, the tribe, than they do the individual. And they sort of like literally denying reality, objective reality based on your ideology. We see that happening so much today and I'm going to just go for the low hanging fruit people denying biological facts between men and women purely and utterly based on their political or their social cultural ideology it is so apparent people denying the fact that little kids do not have the mental capacity to know understand gender and to choose their sex that a 15, 16 year old do not have the mental capacity to understand the long term consequences and effects of cutting off parts of their fucking body and sterilizing themselves. To no longer being able to admit being morbidly obese is fucking unhealthy. Purely based on someone's political or social or cultural ideology. You're literally denying reality. And again, he points out in the beginning that this happens on both sides. That people don't take each subject as an individual subject or topic, analyze it individually, and then come up with a conclusion. Even if you're Republican, even if you're leftist, whatever, it doesn't really matter which side you're on. You kind of just go, this sounds like a conservative thing, so I believe it. I'm not going to really take the time to like dissect it or analyze it individually. I just believe it because it's a part of my ideology. And this is why I go over and over again in my videos. I am not either of those things. I am not labeling myself. I am never going to try myself up and no one's ever going to press me to do so because this is what happens. You stop being a critical thinker and you just become an NPC no matter what side of the coin you are if you do not take each subject and individually judge it on an individual basis. If you don't can't tell, I'm super hyped up for this video. <laughs> anyway, I like I love shit like this guys. Let's continue. Orwell wrote, the peculiarity of the totalitarian state is that though it controls thought, it doesn't fix it. It sets up unquestionable dogmas and it alters them from day to day. It needs the dogmas because it needs absolute obedience from its subjects, but it can't avoid the changes which are dictated by the needs of power politics. It declares itself infallible, and at the same time it attacks the very concept of objective truth. He believed there were totalitarian trends in language, since language could be used to dull the truth, 
hide reality, and even numb the minds of people listening. This is captured in Newspeak in 1984, a language that narrows every year, trying to narrow the range of thought and eventually make unorthodox thought impossible. Orwell was concerned that totalitarianism was spreading worldwide and argued that there were two safeguards against it. One is that truth exists despite people trying to claim otherwise. And the other safeguard is the liberal tradition of freedom and equality, which guarantees the right to argue for truth against political pressures that might make truth unpopular. He defined liberty saying, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. He was absolute in his defense of liberty, saying any attack on intellectual liberty and on the concept of objective truth threatens in the long run every department of thought. He tied his ideas together in a journal entry written by Winston Smith in 1984, which says, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. Stopping it there. Okay, so I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the Webster Dictionary just changed the definition of female right after changing the definition of racism. And I believe Reddit allegedly is uh, censoring the word groomer. And now you can't even say the word women or woman or female. You have to say birther or some shit like that. They're narrowing the language so they can control your thoughts. And he said even earlier, people self-censoring out of, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, or it doesn't really bother me, or it's not really affecting me right now. Because it will affect you at some point. But when it starts to affect you, it's too late by then. Just to let you know. Like, gee, like I love this video. All right, let's continue. Although he defended individual liberty, George Orwell was not a liberal in the traditional sense of the word. He was anti-capitalist, believing that capitalism is exploitative and that money had distorting effects on truth. For example, writers might follow profit incentives and say what they think people want to hear rather than saying what they think is true. He also believed class inequality led to inequalities in political influence, making capitalist societies inherently flawed democracies. The social model that best upheld the principles of freedom and equality, he argued, was democratic socialism. Democratic socialism to Orwell didn't mean a welfarist version of capitalism. It meant using democracy to vote in a new, mostly classless society with centralized means of production and income levels controlled to the point of being approximately, but not exactly, equal. Orwell's support for democratic socialism motivated more of his work than many realize. As he explained in a preface for Animal Farm, the book wasn't condemning socialism. It was trying to separate it from Soviet communism and allow for a revival of socialism. His most extensive argument for democratic socialism is in The Lion and the Unicorn, written in England in 1941, while German bombers flew overhead. Although Hitler's regime was morally wrong, Orwell argued that the English could learn something practical from it. He said of the English ruling class, to understand fascism, they would have to study the theory of socialism, which would have forced them to realize that the economic system by which they lived was unjust, inefficient, and out of date. Orwell believed Hitler's military success while appropriating aspects of socialism physically debunked capitalism, and once and for all proved that a planned economy is stronger than a planless one. He described fascism as a form of capitalism that borrows from socialism features that make it efficient for war purposes. And he distinguishes the two, saying socialism aims for a world state of free and equal human beings. It takes equality of human rights for granted, and fascism does the opposite. Fascism is the belief in human inequality, and in the case of Germany, German superiority. Orwell argued that for England to win the war, they should turn it into a revolutionary war, waging war against both Germany and class inequality. At the end of the war, Orwell openly reflected on those claims and said in some aspects he was wrong, but he still believed in the socialist cause. Summarizing his own career in 1946, he said, the Spanish War and other events in 1936 and 37 
turned the scale, and thereafter I knew where I stood. Every line of serious work that I have written since 1936 has been written, directly or indirectly, against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. Orwell lived long enough to see an influential critique published that said socialism itself leads to totalitarianism, and he responded, effectively agreeing that it was a threat, but arguing that the injustice of capitalism made it a risk worth taking. In one of the final essays of his career, he wrote, A socialist United States of Europe seems to me the only worthwhile political objective today, which would be founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and internationalism, which he believed was being held back by the apathy and conservatism of people everywhere. Okay, so I disagree with the socialist idea. I don't think that the risk of socialism becoming totalitarianism is a risk worth taking, like, at all. The risk of socialism and being um, very centralized power and that power not being corrupted to me is never a risk worth taking. However, I believe Canada, Norway, a lot of the Norwegian, Denmark, a lot of the Norwegian countries run over under a democratic socialist sort of economy. It is not pure socialism. I think like Bernie Sanders like to always use those countries as an example. They're not purely socialist. But then again, if you look at the uh, medical, the, the, the medical system in Canada is very flawed. Even though it's free, there's very, very long waiting lines and the the, all of the interve medical interventions and stuff like that comes from us and they take from us because they don't have the money to do so. But anyway, I understand a bit what he's saying though when it comes to just because something makes more money then that's what you push. And he used the idea of literature or media. Well, right now we know that the mainstream media they fund, they fund their organization through rage, right? Rage bait. The, the, the articles that can upset you the most, the most extreme articles, the clickbait is what makes money. So instead of telling the news the way the news should be told, they give the news to the audience the way they wanted because that was makes money. And I do think that system is flawed. Or well, the idea of that money can buy should have been reality, right? We watched social dilemma and how Silicon Valley overlords can basically create perspective and perception because of the massive amount of money they have to do so or people owning the media whoever owns controls the media controls society controls the minds right and they can do that because of the mass amount of money that they have or the money that's in government people being able to lobby and change laws and change the system because they have the money to do so so I don't think capitalism is in inherently inherently flawed i just think capitalism like most systems if not all systems can be corrupted and can be flawed he says that he believes in controlling income levels to a point where it's equal i don't believe that's equal that's equity well not equal opportunity but equal outcome that everybody gets the same amount of money no matter what they do no matter what they achieve no matter how much they hard they try or whatever i don't believe in that system whatsoever I've i'm definitely not completely against like universal income but if only if you can have the set amount of income that's only enough so you can be okay only enough so you can survive and that's it but still allow people to be able to make more money if they choose so because i think hard work should be rewarded and that inherently is going to create a class system because if you have more money you're going to have a higher class right so i understand what he was saying about socialism it definitely sounds like the whole stereotype of socialism which is never done right kind of thing and i mean it's been a long time if it hasn't been done right will it ever be actually done right but i guess the people who are arguing against capitalism would also say capitalism was never done right but anyway guys that's the end of this video i very much enjoyed this video so much i hope you guys enjoyed it too this video is running off long enough so I'm going to stop it here. You guys, please have an amazing day. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell to get the notifications when I do upload. And if you like, you can donate or give a super thanks or something like that. And you guys have an amazing day. Bye. The end of World War II freed Orwell to write more outside of politics, often playfully. He praises the beauty of the common toad, a subject he chose because toads never get much of a boost from poets. And he wrote at length about his favorite bar, the moon underwater 
and the ten qualities that made it the perfect pub, only to say there is no such place as the moon underwater. He did say there was a bar with eight of those ten qualities. The two things it missed were draft stout and china mugs. In more serious writing, he explored the nature of hedonism and said that modern inventions like film and the radio weaken our consciousness and dull our curiosity and instead we should try to preserve patches of simplicity in our lives and apply a litmus test to new products from science and industry. Does this make me more human or less human? But Norwell's own assessment, politics brought out the best in him, writing, Looking back through my work, I see it is invariably where I lacked a political purpose that I wrote lifeless books and was betrayed into purple passages, sentences without meaning, decorative adjectives, and humbug generally. There are no surviving film or audio records of George Orwell, but it's likely through his political writing that he'll go on being remembered.